Hi, Liam. Mr. Baron, will we be having a second SAQ today? Not today. I want to do Not it. Today. I want to talk about the SAQ before we actually do it. Do the next one. Uh -huh. I like uh, Caleb. I like your thesis and reasoning. Uh, be sure to. Um, you can repeat the exact same words from your thesis, so. Your reasoning doesn't doesn't look great for D. Um, is that German's willingness to fight against the Allied powers in Serbia? Uh, I don't know, I think that works. Because you're talking about how militarism makes them willing to go to war, right? Okay. Okay. Nice. Yeah. I'll put those points in for you. Oh, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Change the. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. And I hope by tomorrow I should get that uh, essay. So. Okay. That's my. Goal. Sounds good. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye. See you later. I think we'll talk about art first and then we'll go over the DBQ a little bit. Morning. Eleanor, what's up for this weekend? What? What's up this weekend? Big plans? Um, I'm going to a church retreat. Oh, cool. Yeah. Where's that at? I don't know. They just told us to go on a bus and go to <laughs> I'm sure there's a there's a joke in there somewhere, but I'm just gonna leave it alone. Hi, 
What's up, Ben? What's up, Ben? Good, how are you? Doing well. Are there grades in the grade book? For the DDQ? For the DDQ? No, no, yeah. I've gotten through about a third of them. <laughs> Why are we going when, over it? When you get to mine, just just know it's not about the last one. I'll just, I'll just pass it. It's fine. all of you. Hi, everybody at home. Say hi back. Hi, Mr. Barron. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Awesome. Hola, senor. Drink. Hola. Hola. <laughs> uh, during the first hour of my, I couldn't hear anybody, which was weird. We just rolled with it. So I'm glad to, to be able to hear people. I think if that ever happened, I just restarted eventually. After I just went, through, went with it, and then I restarted, and you know, restarting oftentimes solves problems. Mr. Brown was hi in German. Um, you know, actually very cool young people say hi. Hi. Yeah, but generally it's hello. Hello. Tag, guten Tag. I know how to say bye. How do you say bye? Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen, yeah. I don't say don't shoot. What do you need to say? Don't shoot. Don't shoot. That's Nicht important. Nicht schießen, yeah, that's very important. Um, instead of learning German today, which I, I would actually like to do, um, we're going to talk about art for the last time. Oh. I know, a little painful for me. Um, some very um, sort of out there art movements and then some very not out there art movements. And you'll see that, I hope, you'll see that my idea, my thesis that art is a reflection of its time or art is a reflection of its society, I, I think you'll see that that holds up. Uh, after that, we should have a little bit of time, and I'd like to just kind of look at the DBQ with you. Um, most of us are going to look at the DBQ together and just see some of the documents, maybe talk about thesis and, and stuff like that. I'm, I'm done with about a third of them. I'll get the rest of them done probably this weekend and uh, give you a grade. And then I had hoped that a lot of you would be back on Monday. It doesn't seem that that's going to be the case. <laughs> so... Um, uh, I'll, I'll get the DBQs back to people who are here, and then maybe I'll do what I did last time, which was like try to, what did I do? Um, Hold on to them, and then give them back later. Yeah, or I, I hopefully I, I photographed them, or I um, scanned them and sent them to you with the feedback and that sort of thing. I printed them all out, which makes it so much easier for me to to grade, and I can just write all over it. I hate doing the turn it in, you know, blah 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 on the side stuff. It just takes me forever. The art that we're doing for this unit is it is this the new unit like modern? It's modern? yeah, it's oh, the end. So it's it's really kind of a, a 20th century art is really what we're talking about. So let me get going on that and um, and like I said, hopefully there's some connections between uh, between what we look at and uh, and that period of time. 
So I'm sharing. I am putting this up. I need to do this. Whoops. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to record this one because I don't think I have this recorded. Or not. Never mind. Let's just do this thing. All right. You guys at home can see this, yes? And you guys here can see this, yes? So let's take some notes on 20th century art. Once again, to end the year, um, I'm trying to, to prove to you that art is a reflection of this time. Do you remember the very first art movement we talked about? Was it realism? It's sort of, well, it's real, more realistic than what it was. Doc, say it out loud. Renaissance. It's sort of this pre-Renaissance moving into the Renaissance. And of course, the Renaissance is about humanism. And so then it started to become more real and they started to become better artists. And then you had this whole art movement. So we had the Renaissance and Renaissance art. We had the Northern Renaissance, Northern Renaissance art. From there, we had the art of, uh, of the Catholic Reformation. Do you remember what art movement that was? Baroque. Baroque, yeah. I mean, trying to show, trying to show simple believers. They're not trying to sermon them with the word of God like a Protestant might. They're trying to show them what uh, what heaven would be like or how they should act, uh, you know, in in, the, in a Catholic way, having faith and listening to the Pope and so on. Um, lives of saints and, and this, that, and the other. We also saw the the glories of the Dutch with Baroque. We also saw the royal state with with Baroque. I'd like to encourage you this weekend if you have some time to look at unit one from AP Euro, review unit one, look at your notes, uh, look at a summary of unit one, look at a summary of the Renaissance and uh, Northern Renaissance and so on. Just if you can, if you can kind of along the next few weekends, do one, unit two, unit three, four, I think you'll be, uh, you'll be set for the 19th of May, the online uh, AP Euro exam. There's also, as you know, I, I opened that uh, that multiple choice um, quiz up for you for units one and two so far. So uh, feel free to uh, to do that. I encourage that. So um, Baroque art went. Uh, we moved away from Baroque art. We looked at the art of nobles at play. After that, when the nobles started to come back and seize power away from the the royal state of of uh, absolute monarchs. anybody anybody got the got nobles at play? What that was called? Rococo. Rococo. Starts with an R. Uh, yeah, Rococo. And then Rococo gave way to neoclassicism, the art of the French Revolution, trying to show off virtues of the French Revolution. You know, what, what should you be like as a good citizen? You're not a wasteful noble anymore, just whiling away your hours with wine, women, and song. You are now somebody who has the same kinds of virtues that the old Romans and Greeks did. That gives way to... Eleanor? Romanticism. I love romanticism, right? Uh, nature, power of nature, the grotesque fantasy, Middle Ages, and so on. From there, we went to the, the, the sort of the, the opposite of that. By the way, heroism and spontaneity and all those other things. The opposite of that, then, is realism, what life is really like in the hard bit in 1840s. Beyond that, then we got to, um, well, the bourgeoisie at play pastels, brush strokes that are sort of, you know, um, fuzzy, ponds with clouds and, and, and lily pads and so on. And that's called impressionism. impressionism. Yeah. And then from there, we started to look at sort of what artists felt like, how they started to express emotion. Look, look at Van Gogh, for example, and his crazy sunflowers or his crazy starry nights or poor uh, who's the guy who does the scream? Yeah, 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 yeah. Edvard Munch. So 
uh, you've got this sort of, you know, psychological states of people having stress and anxiety towards 1900 or so. Let's jump into the 20th century and look at an anti-art movement called Dadaism or Dada. <laughs> yep. It's, it, you know, we get to the point where it seems like things get played out. You know, things are at the end. And so let's do something that's almost like a joke art. It seems to me that Dadaism is that. Dada means hobby horse, or it could mean father. It's an anti-art art movement. They are attacking the rational, civilized standards of the time. Let's face it, 1900, the Europeans are so filled with themselves. You know, contextually, what the Europeans are doing in 1900. Imperialism. Exactly. They are showing the rest of the world how civilized they are and what burden they have to show others how to live. But what are they really doing? They're exploiting the rest of the world. And this civilized, advanced uh, uh, society is about to jump into the most horrific war that the world has ever seen. So it just doesn't really make a whole heck of a lot of sense. I get how artists who are these, you know, thinkers and bohemians and so on would say, well, let's create an anti-art movement. Civilization, my friends, has failed. And so let's just create things like this. Oh, I should have warned you about the nudity. I apologize. Uh, this is called, this is uh, Marcel Duchamp's Bride Stripped Bear by Her Bachelors. Please don't go home and say that you looked at porn today. It, it is art. So the uh, naked bride that you see. Wait, let me check. Um, I think I got the bachelor's. You guys see the bachelors? And I guess that's the bride. I'm not pointing at anything, friends. <laughs> uh, is is this thing the bride? That looks like a playground swing for you. Bachelors? This would be closed on Twitter. I don't know. Uh, I, I, it's an anti-art movement, so you know they're doing whatever they want to do. Oh, ah, I forgot to tell you, there's a nude coming up. This is a nude descending a staircase. At least that one I can kind of, I sort of see it. Do you sort of see it? No? Do you see the movement down the staircase? No? It's like those Garfield comics where you have like a bunch of the little ones. I'll have to trust you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so at least here, you know, it's kind of like going back before the Renaissance, when the Renaissance started to become snapshots of time. Before the Renaissance, it was like, you know, pictures that had different points in time all thrown together. This is uh, showing you movement in, in static art, I guess. Okay, let's move beyond on the, in an anti-art movement. There's also something around 1910-ish or so and, and moving forward. This is an Italian art movement called Futurism. And it, it exemplifies its time because um, instead of attacking the rationalized civilization that was producing, you know, irrational imperialism and war, this emphasizes the 20th century's uh, speed and technology, and then later youth and violence. Um, World War I is going to break out, obviously, and, uh, and, and you get people, well, in Italy, the Squadristi or the um, or Mussolini's uh, black-shirted thugs that, uh, that are kind of into futurism. The car, the airplane, the industrial city, all that kind of stuff is, um, is, is present in uh, futurist art. I think, in fact, there was uh, a stimulus. The very first stimulus on the multiple choice test was by a futurist. Not that you particularly needed to know about futurism to, to answer those questions. But let's look at some, some futurism uh, in art. 
This is called The City Rises. Uh, comments or questions? I like it. Cool. Yeah. What do you like about it? Uh, there's a lot of movement. I like all the different colors. I think they work well together. Totally agree with you. There's a lot of movement. I mean, how does one, if you're an artist and you want to portray movement in art, how would you do that? It's, you know, it's tough. But I think they're doing it here. Do you see, do you see what I see? In the there's like two big things that are moving in sort of the middle of everything. Is that a bull or a horse? I I think it's a I think there are two horses at least there. Do you see horses? Yeah, I see them. Yeah, one's kind of a reddish brown, and the other one is kind of white. And then there's a bunch of men that are doing something. They seem to be, you know, that horse might be attached to a a wagon of some kind, and they seem to be pulling it along. There's a city in the background. You see it a top left? As evidence of sort of a more modern city. Do you see what I see on the top left? Yeah, there's smoke coming out of a, some sort of smokestack or chimney. Um, top left, I see like a trolley car or, or railroad car. Do you see that? And then the right, there's some sort of office building and more smokestacks. And yeah, anyway, it's futurism. It's 1910. It's a modern industrial city. There's a guy maybe with a wheelbarrow down at the bottom left. No, no. Let's move away from uh, this, these, these art movements where people are just doing whatever they want to do and creating movement or, or creating, you know, uh, things that don't look at all like what they're supposed to look like. And and have like a, a, a the screeching of the brakes as Nazism happens. And Hitler, if you remember, Hitler was a failed artist. And, um, and so Hitler fancies himself a connoisseur of art and an architect. And so he knows what good art is. And you might remember Goebbels, Joseph Goebbels is the minister of propaganda. He's in charge of art. The Nazis actually have degenerate art shows where they, they, they have, you know, filling, filling a museum with art that is degenerate. It's disgusting. It's made, it's that other stuff. You know, it, it's impressionism and it's futurism and it's these other sorts of art movements, expressionism. And officially you're, what you're supposed to do there as a good Nazi is go and say, oh, this is disgusting. I hate this. You know, this isn't good art. The Nazis have good art, according to the Nazis. But really, people go there and they actually they want to go and look at the digital art because they actually kind of like it. Nazi art is very, well, look at it. Those are um, kind of the themes of Nazi art, Nazi themes. Do, do you see it? What sorts of things are, are, are thematically in the art that you see there? Perfect Aryan people. Perfect Aryan people, perfect bodies, perfect breeders, perfect Aryans, right? The, the, the body is important. The mind is not important. You shouldn't think great thoughts. You should obey. And the person who you should obey is there. There's a lot of Hitler in Nazi art. <laughs> Hitler as, you know, uh, the leader, uh, as the genius, the thinker. Doc has a question. Yeah, it looks like in that big, um portrait of Hitler, we would go to the Napoleon pose where he has one hand <laughs> yeah. and he's not in use in his pose. Yes, somewhat. He's, it looks like, to me, it looks like it's on a, on his uh, uh, on his hip. So he can be sassy. He looks a little sassy. I like his iron cross. He's reminding you that he's a veteran of World War I and that he uh, he did a good job in World War I. There's a lot of Hitler busts. There's a lot of statues of, uh, of once again, bodies nearly nude or nude bodies, the perfect Aryan body, not the degenerate body of some, you know, intellectual or, or, or an old person or an infirmed person or the people who are slated for destruction, you know, perfect uh, Aryan bodies. Um, yeah, I don't know. I like the, I like the, the postcardish quality picture of that perfect Aryan family. What's mom up to? She's breastfeeding. Yeah. So, yeah. 
motherhood and and she's even you can tell that she's kind of a peasant lady working outside because she's got a nice farmer's tan going on oh if only they had a Volkswagen to drive around in and then eagles and swastikas a lot of eagles a lot of swastikas everywhere well on the other side of the ideological spectrum we've got socialist realism this is you know realist art once again it's not uh degenerate capitalist art i don't know if you've ever thought about that but art is created um in many respects to be sold on the open market sometimes fifty thousand dollars or you know five million dollars for a drop of paint it's, it's kind of crazy uh but socialist realism is supposed to show you what they find important um what do you see there in socialist realism as the the themes of socialist realism Uh, maybe like communities and a lot of people hanging out together. Yeah, what kind of people are hanging out? Uh, maybe like peasant or lower class mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Out in the fields. That, you got it. The people who wield the sickle from the hammer and sickle story, right? Um, the, the statue that you have there of the young woman with the sickle, do you see the young man next to her as they're marching forward into history or progress or whatever? What's he got in his hand? Hammer. So hammer and sickle and the industrial worker and the, the peasant uh, woman or the farmer woman. And then you've got, do you, do, do you recognize the guy who's talking to the peasants in the top left? It's Lenin. It's Lenin. And then do you see who is uh, advancing on stage and, and being cheered by the, by the uh, maybe the central committee of the Communist Party? Stalin, and you might remember we also looked at some some uh, some paint some paintings of Stalin where a bunch of little kids these are mostly posters a bunch of little kids were adoring Stalin because you know he's just so adorable. Um, here's Stalin is being applauded by uh, by the other party hacks, and then there's Lenin up there pointing off towards you know a, a better future for the working class. So realism in Nazism, realism for. Uh, for uh, uh, communism as well. Surrealism is back to degenerate art, <laughs> so to speak. Surrealism, it comes after World War I, and World War I shakes people's faith in what is real. It, uh, it starts to dabble in uh, the fantasies and dreams of Freud's subconscious. It's all about what's going on inside of your mind. And it's really a search for subconscious forces that mold reality. What is real? Sometimes it's hard to know. So we get, you know, just introspection, I guess. People thinking a lot. In, in kind of a, a, a weird way, fantasies and dreams Kind of reminds me of romanticism a little bit, but you know, from a much more scientific, psychological point of view, I guess. Here's Dali's The Persistence of Memory from 1931. Salvador Dali. Uh, anybody want to say anything about this? Let's talk about it. Yeah. You know, do clocks work at all, really? With Einstein's physics, um, time and space are really quite relative. They, you know, time doesn't progress like we think it does, and it isn't even what we think it is, and space isn't really what we think it is. And so, you know, droopy clocks or dripping clocks, in a weird sort of way, makes sense. Isn't this one really famous? This is really famous, yeah. I think the, the persistence, uh, persistence of memory is his most famous. I like the thing in the middle with with the droopy clock on it. I know this. What it was it? Horse? The, the, it's sort of a skin colored thing. Yeah, it looks like, yeah. yeah. I think it looks like a duck too. Weird, like a, it looks like a mouse. Yeah. But I think what it actually is is part of a face. And I think it's an eye. Does, does that make sense to you? These are eyelashes. This bit right here. 
like a nose would be weird. I don't know what this is. <laughs> yeah, it's like all of the upper things, and it has two noses. And there's a smaller nose, no one does. It's very, I think it's very odd. Could it be an eyebrow? <laughs> yeah, maybe somebody shaved their eyebrow, and then they did a piercing up there, and now they removed the piercing. And that's what you get. I'm sure that's not it, but you know. See what you want. Here is Dali's The Metamorphosis of Narcissus. Anybody want to? <laughs> anybody want to talk about that one? I actually I like this one. I think this one is really uh, cooler than the last one. He, he, in in what way? I don't know. The shapes are just like not weird like that. But the more. Mm. So I, I think about Narcissus, and I think Narcissus is this person, you know, narcissism where you like to you love yourself. And I think that was Narcissus's deal that Narcissus looked into a mirror. Yeah. Uh, I think it was actually a pond or a body of water and saw themselves and like became enthralled with that. Um, I like that you have this sort of mirror image of, you see the, the hand with the egg? And then the, the, the mirror image or the other image of that hand with the egg, it's actually a person. Do you see that? So I think that's kind of cool. The rest of it just kind of freaks me out and is, is I don't have no idea what's going on. There's people in the background, a whole bunch of people in the background. So I don't know. Cubism. <laughs> Cubism is um, taking shapes, normal shapes, body shapes, you know, um, shapes of everyday objects and trying to turn them into geometric shapes. Um, just a way of looking at the world and, and allegedly, uh, allegedly this uh, robotic image of man could have something to do with industrialization um, and, you know, factories and the, the impersonality and, and lack of individualism of modern life or something. It, it seems to me, just me, that um, if you're going to be an artist in the modern period, you just have to be able to talk your way through what you're trying to show people. And then everyone thinks you're really deep and they buy your painting for $5 million. Like one drip of red paint on a white canvas. And if you can talk your way through what it means and how deep it is, boom, $5 million. We have a painting in our like formal living room. It's literally just like a big splat of paint with like strings off it. And my parents paid a lot of money for it. And I and apparently it was like music or something. And I don't understand. That. Perfect, perfect example of that. Yeah. I was once at the Weissman Art Museum for like a ceremony or something. Yeah. And I saw a piece of paper that looked like a bit of like canvas. So I walked closer to it. And the artist took two pieces of paper, yeah. put some glue on the on the other side put them on the blank canvas. Yeah. They're both white. They sold that. Yeah. It's amazing. It's just amazing what, what art is. I like it, performance art too, you know, is where people are actually doing stuff or not doing stuff. You know, like somebody sits in a plastic cube for three days. It's performance art. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We can't diss the art of the mind. I mean, <laughs> that's really important. It, it's true. I, I don't know. I, I think that I could probably make stuff up and I would hope to be able to make a lot of money, but I just, anyway, here's a little uh, uh, Picasso, the ladies of Avignon. I just imagine <laughs> he's got a bunch of um, of young women, and he tells them that he's going to paint them. And you know, he's like, "Well, it's going to be nude." And, and so, they're like, okay, that's fine. And, and they're all standing around, and he's painting, painting, painting. <laughs> and he's done with the painting. They're like, "Oh, can we see it?" And he shows them that. <laughs> Make you pretty insecure. You I, I just feel like they would be uh, not pleased with uh, with how things worked out. But you know, whatever. <laughs> Um, 
three musicians. That looks like three mus musicians to me. I also has some very um, some kind of interesting stories. Uh, he was in France and in Paris when the Nazis took over um, France and he got called in by the Gestapo several times. It, um, obviously, wasn't doing a lot of painting for the public back then. And of course, Guernica. Um, definitely, definitely worth knowing just in terms of you being a human being and, and seeming smart, and, uh, and then also just in terms of, of history and, and, and what that particular painting means. All right. Do you have any, uh, <laughs> any questions uh, about anything art related? Sometimes there are uh, art. Uh, LEQs or SAQs, and um, and um, it's uh, you know if you know a little something about art, then then those are doable. And if you don't, then they are to be avoided. Well, this question. Yeah. In the in the twentieth uh, century, art kind of started to expand out just beyond paintings and music. Yeah. Um, not really. I, I, there is kind of a grab bag, um, uh, a, a, a grab bag lecture that I do. I know it's like women and, and something and art, but I don't think that, that we talk about, we don't talk about movies, for example, or we do talk about, uh, rock and roll a slight amount as part of the youth revolution of 1968. All right. Hey, you guys at home, could you get out the DBQ that we just did? What was that yesterday? That we just yeah. did yesterday? Um, yeah, if you got your own copy, or I hopefully gave you guys a copy there. I just want to kind of look at the DBQ, maybe talk through the DBQ. Oh, we bet. This one going. Did you like the DBQ? Did you think it was doable? Is it easy to come up with uh, with a thesis that you could support? Just waiting for somebody at home to say something. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, good. Um, let's have a look at it. What do you remember uh, arguing? Remember, uh, the actual question is uh, evaluate the extent to which the experience of war uh, altered the lives of European women during the First World War and its aftermath, its immediate aftermath. When you have an extent to which question, it's asking you kind of like how much. And, you know, everybody's pretty much saying that it does alter. Hopefully, you, and, and some of you did this, it alters their lives greatly. And then, then hopefully you had a couple of becauses. Do you remember your because? No. How does the war alter lives greatly? Or, or, or not at all. The women get like more job opportunities. I think that's the most obvious one. Thank you very much for, for throwing that in. I think the most obvious one that's supportable by a number of documents is that women were doing work that they hadn't done before. And I think you can see that in document two. I think you can see it in three. I think you can see it in four. I, can, I think you could see it uh, in kind of a reverse way in five. And you can see it in seven. And then unit, and then document six, maybe. What what job does the does Maria Bochkareva have in document six? Army. Yeah, she's a soldier. She's an honest to goodness soldier, which is kind of crazy to think about, but in fact, uh, that does happen. There are an extreme small number of women, really just in Russia, that that fight uh, actually on the battlefront. So she's a Cossack girl. So um, it's, it's amazing that, that that actually happened. 
part of the deal though was that uh, that they were trying to shame the men into fighting better if that makes sense you know if, the, if these girls can do it you can do it too so don't let them advance by themselves interesting um so that's a real obvious uh, obvious one and then i don't know um coming up with it with another one is, is somewhat difficult i think some of you argued and, and this is part of the reason why um could you also argue that their lives didn't change very much or you could say yes changes because they're finding new jobs they're working these new jobs but no because you know attitudes stayed the same men's attitudes about women or after the war their their ability to work in those jobs goes away something like that okay um what do you think about about document number one what's what's document number one telling us about what kinds of things do you see in, in documents It's kind of advocating why women should uh, vote. Yeah, this is uh, this is from uh, Votes for Heroines as well as Heroes, and uh, it's a cover illustration from a women's magazine. So if you're thinking about the hip, about the point of view, about the intended audience, or or the purpose, or those sorts of things, I think it's pretty obvious that this is to encourage. Uh, it's to encourage that that women. Um, should probably have the vote. Does that actually happen later? It's British, right? Do, do we know that it's British? <laughs> British Prime Minister HHS. So right after the war, women do actually get the vote. And so that could also be hip if you think about it. It's historical context. Maybe you say during the war, women didn't get the vote, but after the war, women get the vote. It's part of you know a longer term sort of uh, desire for women to get the vote. Anyway. That, that could be uh, bits and pieces of hip. Um, do you remember how you used this? I can I can say how I used it. Go for it. Um, so it's it's the drawing with the woman on it, right? Yeah, and the prime yeah. minister? Okay. Um, well, my thesis was kind of what you said before, where it changed because women um, had access to like more jobs and new ones. And but then um, like the way a lot of men, you know, like sexism yeah. and um, some women didn't get the vote after World War One in some countries, and mm -hmm. so I talked. I used that one in my second body paragraph because yeah. the prime minister is pretty much suggesting that only men and soldiers on the battlefield are heroes, yeah. while um, the woman's talking about how the nurses were also heroes, which is why they should get the vote. So I used that to suggest like traditional gender roles and um stereotypes so so maybe things don't change very much is, is one way that you can use this because this man is obsessed with votes for men and doesn't really care that much about votes for women or that you know women were trying to get the vote or, or something like that I, I i like this one and and six together for showing that women were were involved in the war but like not just home front sort of stuff, but really involved in the war and potentially being killed in the war as, as some sort of argument. Do the lives, does the war alter the women's lives? Yeah, they're actually able to participate in war. It, 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 you know, unintentionally here, um, because they're not supposed to be uh, being sunk on a, on a British hospital ship, but they are involved in the war. And they're clearly involved in the war in Document 6 as well, in the actual fighting or dying in the war so uh, that, that could be part of it I, I like this this particular cartoon um do you see who who allegedly did the the the, the painting or the sketch i would never seen this before i just saw this a patriot, a patriot. Yeah, so i like that 
Um, and then the, on the wreath, did you guys see the wreath? To the women and nurses who died, to the, uh, to the wounded soldiers on the Anglia who died. So men and women are dying together in the war. In document six, men and women are dying together in the war. They're equal, perhaps there's a, an argument in there as well. Let's move on to uh, document number two, which is uh, Hindenburg. And if you know Hindenburg, he's the guy who's running Germany during World War I. Says he's just chief of the general staff, but you know he's he and this other guy named Ludendorff are running the whole war, and he's sending a letter to this to the German Chancellor. It's kind of a long text, but essentially what he's what he is uh, saying is women need to work, or women have to work, even though they don't want women to work. Does that seem uh, seem about right? It's an emergency kind of thing. So do what you want with that. You either say women are working, or you could say men don't women to work, we don't want women to work, or things aren't going to change very much because he says after the war, you know, uh, after the war, women are going to go back to the to hearth and home, and men are going to be uh, taking over. So it's a nice document to to be able to use uh, for any and all of those things. Working women disrupt the family, <laughs> um, but women need to work right now so that men can be fighting. Anybody have any uh, any anything that they want to say about document two, the way that they used it, or anything they found interesting about it? He's, he's very sexist, though, or very misogynistic. <laughs> the very first things that he's saying. All intellectual work, physical labor, real manufacturing still fall on men, but we need ladies. Nothing? I used it to say that, well, yeah, women probably got some stuff during the war. It wasn't going to last long as because people in power have these sorts of opinions. That's right. And if you look at document seven, it shows us women in the industrial workforce, you know, it increases during the war and then decreases 1926. It's actually lower than 1911. So, you know, women after the war really do go back to where they're supposed to be, you know, back to the, to, to the domicile, back to, um, back to the, to the house. Uh, document three, thanks for, for, uh, for adding that. Document three is, is by a woman, Countess de Corson. She is a French author and she's writing this thing called French Women During the War. And essentially what she's talking about is the sacrifice of peasant women and how hard peasant women have to work during the so once again, you know, might support your argument that women are having to take over positions that men had before. She's not going to, I think, say that women are um, in any way, shape, or form not up to the task, or should go back, you know, to the to house, to house and, and hearth um, after the war or anything like that. She's just being really, um, really positive about the women's contribution. Kind of makes sense that a woman would be very positive about women, right? Um, and 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 that maybe a man in charge of things would not be so positive about women, but uh, that's her deal. It's a fairly simple, fairly straightforward document. Document four is is one that that um, is really more interesting, perhaps, than you know or or that you you realize. Read the source carefully. So, who is she? Like, who is she beyond a name? What is her position in society? Middle class. And she's writing a, a poem 
not as a middle class lady. She's writing a poem as a working class woman. And then, uh, you know, so she's pretending to be somebody she's not. And then if you look at, at the poem, what do you think about that? If, if in document three, Countess de Corson is saying how great it is that the peasant lady st is stepped up and despite all their pain and anxiety and all that kind of stuff, really got the job done. Is that what Ida Bedford is saying, or Madeline Ida Bedford? No, she's saying that she's spending it all well on good times and clothes. Yeah, she's, she, she's pretending to be a working class woman or girl who is working in a munitions factory, making more money than she's ever made before, and wasting it all on, you know, luxuries, on good times. So it's really a very negative poem. It's sort of like a Victorian, a, a kind of a stuck up snobby Victorian lady criticizing working class women who she, she doesn't know what, what their lives are like. Do you think that's the truth? Do you think that, that they're working in the munitions factory and they're like, I'm making more money than ever and I'm smoking cigarettes and you know, um, wearing silk stockings and having a great time. And you know what? This factory might blow up, but we don't care as long as we're having a good time. So there's all that, but does it show you that women are working? Yeah, you can totally use it just as that. There are women who are working in munitions factories. Sometimes they blow up, by the way, and, and that's a bit of a problem. Um, but also, uh, women are gaining a little bit of independence, or at least being able to, uh, to spend money on their own without having men control them. Maybe that's something that you have as a uh, evidence beyond the documents. I like document number five because I think G.F. Wilby is kind of a jerk. <laughs> He's writing to his fiance Ethel, and and what can you prove with with document number five? I like my work right Okay. Yeah, he called. He he he's saying don't go to work, right? Don't work in the munitions factory. Heck. From what I understand, those girls in the munitions factory just spend all their money anyway. Uh, so, you know, don't go to work. Does that prove that women are working? It does. If you say it that way, if you argue it that way, right? Um, and it also proves, us, proves to us that men don't want women to work or that men are resistant to the idea of, of ladies um, having any kind of different life. And so once again, your argument is women have these different positions. Fantastic, here's, here's evidence. Or if your argument is, hey, um, things are going to change much for ladies because men are still really misog misogynistic and, and not, uh, not wanting women to change very much. So <laughs> it's a great document. Um, as far as hip is concerned, uh, this guy's point of view is kind of as, as you know, uh, as somebody who doesn't want any change or as, as a kind of chauvinist or a male chauvinist. And so... Um, it's a, it's a very personal kind of appeal to that particular person to not go into, um, not go to work. And so um, maybe there's something you could do with hip there as well. Do you think this is his true, his true opinion is that women shouldn't work? Because? Maybe, maybe not, but just that his fiance shouldn't. Yeah. Because he wants to, he used the word little, I think, several times um, yeah. in calling her a lovable little woman. So I yeah. think that he didn't want her to change, but he didn't care so much about other women. But I yeah. think that he tried to belittle her through that letter a bit and kind yeah. of bully her into not working. Yeah, he wants to kind of control her. And, but, I, you know, if you're, if you're looking at, if you're a historian and you're trying to figure out attitudes of men at this period of time, this is a really good document to do that. There's no reason for him to, to, you know, hide his opinion or anything like that. He's just, he's telling his fiance, he doesn't want her working. A lot of men don't want women working because they don't feel like women should work. You know, it takes away from their, from being their, their little, uh, 
<laughs> this little lovable woman or what have you. And so it's a, it's a great document just to figure out what sorts of attitudes people had. Document six, like I said, it's this Russian woman who's actually fighting. Do you believe all this? Is there a reason why we could we could doubt the, the account that she's giving? Or is there a reason why you think that it is really what's going on? She's got a card up to the memoir. What, what do you think, Danielle? She's got a card up to the memoir. So she's playing it up for a memoir. Yeah. I think probably. Okay. You could say that. So her intended audience is like, you know, these people who, um, or her purpose, let's say, her purpose is to play up the role that she played in the war. And so maybe it's not completely accurate. Does it show that still women are in the war? Yeah, probably so. But, um, but were they really that courageous? Did they really, you know, shame the men on the battlefield, that kind of stuff? Eh, maybe not. Um, I also like that it was um it's done in 1919 i don't know if it's quite soviet union yet but um but there's at least a civil war going on so hi doc yeah we'll be done here just a second and then you know doc is just um that uh that those statistics about the number of women work and the women don't work it's no surprise to me that women were being kicked out of uh factories because Men just don't want it and don't like it. A lot of misogyny. I'll finish uh, uh, up the DBQs, like I said, this weekend, today, Saturday, Sunday, and uh, have a grade for you. And then I'll, I'll give the feedback back to you in some way, shape, or form. It takes a, a whole bunch of scanning to do. Um, like I said, if you can, do, the, uh, do a little bit of reviewing. For, doc, for uh, unit one over the weekend. And if you have any questions or anything, um, send them my way because I'm more than happy to, to entertain questions. But otherwise, have a nice weekend. I'll see you next week. Next week, I do want to do an, an SAQ, but you know we'll, we'll figure out when that is. So it won't be Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Have a nice day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Baron. Have a Thank great you, Mr. Baron. Yeah, see ya.